Good to be here this morning and share with you from the Word of God. We're in the book of Judges. We're in chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 21, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. And our uh, title this for this session is going to be Sowing Bad Seeds. And uh, we're going to see that uh, there are going to be seeds sown in this chapter that are going to reap a horrible harvest in the next chapter. And so we begin in verse 21. It says, Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the way of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold beside ornaments of, and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camel's necks. And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, and they saw that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. And Jerobal, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulchre of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, and made Baal beareth their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. And so I started in verse 21, even though we had looked at that last time, but just because of the phrase at the end where it says, and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks, because that is going to certainly play in to the, the section that we're going to be looking at, where part of the, the, the treasure of gold that Gideon would get included the ornaments from the camel's necks. And just an interesting thing about the ornaments on these camel's necks, uh, many uh, scholars uh, that have studied this believe that these were crescent shaped like a like a crescent moon and uh, there's a there's kind of evidence of this in scripture as well in Isaiah chapter 3 we we get this idea of these moon shaped ornaments Isaiah 3 and verse 18 uh, it says <clears throat> In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. Okay, so so, so kind of these moon-shaped half-crescent uh, ornaments, and of course, there have been archaeological discoveries that have confirmed this. And I, I'm only saying it for the simple reason that there is a, a one of the major world religions and, of course, we know that one of the symbols connected with it is a crescent moon. And I just want to say that there's no question that the origins of that world religion is purely pagan. 
And actually, it is really connected with the worship of the moon god. And again, I'm not going to say any more, but I just think it's just kind of interesting to me. Uh, you wonder where these things come from, where this symbolism comes from, all of the rest of it. Well, I can tell you that that's exactly where it comes from. And it really is a paganistic background to that religion. And you can certainly see it in the conduct of those that follow it for the most part. So anyway, just wanted to mention that. But anyway, these uh, Gideons uh, took this spoil, as we're going to see in the uh, following section. And of course, it, it would become a snare, not just to him, but to the children of Israel. So the, first, the, the next test, and remember, we said there, there are uh, four tests that Gideon gets after victory. And sometimes after a significant victory, where we are tested uh, by the Lord after that victory, uh, how are we going to respond? Is there going to be any pride in our hearts that would take any credit for the victory that he has just given, for instance? And so we've got to be uh, constantly vigilant, especially after a victory, uh, that the enemy does not somehow trip us up. And so we're going to see in verse 22, it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And so immediately there's a, a tremendous test given to Gideon. Uh, we want you to set up your name and your family as a dynasty and be a king over us, rule thou over us, not just you, but your son and your son's sons. And so once again, we see Gideon handles this in, in a sublime, marvelous way. And, and what Gideon says to them, verse 23, Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And there's one thing for sure. Gideon knew where the victory came from. Children of Israel obviously didn't get that because they said, uh, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And it wasn't Gideon that delivered them from the hand of Midian. And Gideon knew that very well. Yes, God used him, but the deliverance came from another place. It came from the Lord. And as we look back, uh, we just remind ourselves of the many occasions where we see that it was God who brought the deliverance. So back in chapter 7, verse 15, and it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream, the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the, uh, into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Chapter 6, verse 34, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered to him. And then again, back in 7 and verse 22, it says, in 722, it says, And 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitter of Zerath, and to the border of Abel Mehola unto Tabath. And so Gideon recognizes that the success that had been experienced, the victory that had been won, was not his victory. He had just entered in to the victory that the Lord had won. And of course, we should recognize the same thing, right? Thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we're walking in victory today, it's not because of our willpower or our, uh, our uh, diligence. It's because the Lord has given us victory, and, and he is the one who alone should get the glory. And I love that scene in the book of Revelation, where crowns are cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And it's just an acknowledgement that any good that has been accomplished in the life of a saint of God is because of what the Lord has done. And he alone is worthy, as it were, to get the glory, the accolade, the adoration from it. So Gideon handles this very, very well. But how sad that the children of Israel didn't see that it was the Lord that had brought the deliverance. They said in verse 22, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And it's very easy, isn't it, for us to, uh, to, to focus on human instruments and lose the sight of the fact that it's God that gives the victory. 
and that he is the one that should get the glory. And so, again, think about this. Gideon is offered a royal dynasty, dynasty. thou, thy son, and thy son's son also. And yet, very admirably, he rejects it and says, the Lord rule over you. Uh, what Gideon said was so commendable. And yet, tragically, even though he said it, what we're going to find is that he somehow he began to live like a king. <laughs> he began to live like the future kings of Israel uh, in different aspects. Uh, for instance, uh, he had many wives. Uh, we, we see that in, in verse 30, Gideon had three score and 10 sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And so it reminds us a little bit of David and Solomon. And uh, he called the the son of his um, concubine, Abimelech, uh, which means my father is king. <laughs> and so uh, kind of interesting that, and, and I wonder, and I just let me just kind of give my little thought here, because if you look back at chapter 8, verse 18, you know how the enemy works. And I think one of the ways he works is what we call the fiery darts of the wicked one. And I believe those fiery darts are suggestions that the enemy puts into our minds. And so where did that this whole suggestion come to him about living like a king, that he would even name a son, my father is king, that he would even uh, take many wives and kind of act a bit like a king? Well, look at verse 18 of chapter 8. It says, Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou out, thou art, so were they, each one resembled the children of a king. And so uh, these, these uh, rulers of Midian, <laughs> they said uh, Gideon had kingly characteristics, kingly qualities. And he said, these other men were like you, like they're children of a king. And so I wondered, did that suggestion come into his mind? Uh, and, and even though he rejected the offer, there's, there's kind of an element that we're going to see in the rest of the chapter where he begins to act a bit like a king. And again, we just have to recognize that how the enemy attacks us. Often it's suggestions in a person's mind. And how do we do that? How do we handle that? Well, we saw in 2 Corinthians, we're to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of, of God. And so we need to, as it were, cast down any of these suggestions. We need to refuse them. And we need to just recognize our lower state rather than uh, thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. And so uh, Gideon certainly uh, lived like a king. And of course, we said their request was a confession of unbelief because they had forgot that God was their king and that God was their deliverer. So again, just in, in a practical sense, as we think of this in New Testament terminology, um, look at 1 Thessalonians 5 with me for a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verses 12 and 13. And it's having this right attitude towards the uh, those that God uses uh, in our lives, uh, and so he says in verse 12, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, verse Thessalonians 5, verse 12, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And so we, we do want to esteem uh, the Lord's servants that have had a big influence in our lives. And we, we recognize that. And we, we've got, we all have our heroes, uh, men that have had a profound influence in our lives. And we thank God for them. But we never need to lose sight of the fact that although God uses them, it is God working in them and through them is the source of the blessing. And we always have to keep in mind uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, that in all things he, the Lord Jesus, might have the preeminence. Yes, we, we do respect and we do give thanks for godly influences in our lives, but we recognize that how God has used these men is that he, 
through his spirit, has used them in a significant way in his life, and he alone is to get the glory. And yet, at the same time, we do esteem them and we value them. But we should all be like not Abimelech, but Elimelech, although Elimelech wasn't exactly the, the, the most wonderful example, but it simply says Elimelech means my God is king. You know, that's how we should recognize. We often sing, king of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget, so on and so forth, you know the rest of the song. So there certainly should be a sense of uh, we recognize my God is king, and the Lord shall rule over you. So now we come to the final test of Gideon, and up to now, he has passed all of the tests. Praise God for that. Three successful tests passed. But now we come to the fourth test. And sadly, he fails the fourth test. And of course, um, this test doesn't come from an external source. It doesn't come from the, the children of Israel. It comes from within his own heart. Notice verse 24, Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you. And so it comes from the, the I. And of course, when we're at our most vulnerable is when I, me, my, and myself is prominent in our lives more than it ought to be. And so Gideon fails the final hurdle. And again, before we go into the failure, we, we, we need to just say this, and I think we need to say this for all of us. We must remain vigilant to our final breath. The enemy never gives up. And if he could get us to stumble, especially as we approach the end of the race, how uh, that would cause the people of God's enemies to gloat and to rejoice, right? The unbelievers to rejoice but how it would cause the younger ones who are looking on to stumble. And so every one of us, uh, we need to recognize we're running this race, but we're not done until we're done. We can't relax until we've crossed that finish line, that final finish line. And the Lord says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And, and again, can I just exhort all of us uh, this, because some of us on this call are, well, we, we're hoary headed, you know, we, we're getting older and uh, we might just uh, exalt one another daily while it's still today, right? That we should, uh, we should cleave to the Lord and that we want to finish strong. And, oh, Lord, don't allow me to dishonor your name, especially as I reach the final lap of the race. Lord, I want to honor your name to the very last breath. And so we need to watch and pray. And so um, he says, I would desire a request of you. And so we said it didn't, this, this didn't come from outside. Uh, this didn't come from the children of Israel, but it was springing from his own heart. And of, of course, we know the words of Jeremiah 17, 9, I suppose even if we're not good at memorizing Bible verses, I doubt there's anybody on here that doesn't know Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things, who can know it? And that's our heart. Our heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. And, and so out of his own heart comes this request. And we're told in Proverbs 4, verse 23, and I, I think it's a great verse, another one that we should all memorize, and this is this, guard your heart, for out of it cometh the issues of life. Oh, brethren, guard your hearts. Uh, let's make, make sure our hearts are, are in tune with his heart, that there's, there's no uh, sin in our lives, that we, we don't indulge the self-life and allow uh, self to dominate. And so he says, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey, the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Uh, again, verse uh, 25, it says, they answered, we will willingly give them. 
and they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And verse 26, the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. Remember, we just saw that in verse 21, the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. So he gets quite a, a treasure trove here. Uh, 1,700 shekels. Now, what is 1,700 shekels? Well, I'm told uh, by biblical experts and scholars that that's 42 pounds or 19 kilograms of gold. And so I decided, uh, not that I have any gold, but I thought, well, I'll just see what the current value of 19 kilograms of gold is. And in US dollars, it's it's uh, current value of 1,700 shekels of gold or, or 19 kilograms is 971,944 US dollars. So almost a million US dollars. And if you think in Canadian, just so you realize I'm thinking about you guys, and I, I even went and checked what Canadian uh, exchange rate would be, and it's 1,232,390 Canadian dollars and 97 cents. So that's quite a haul, isn't it? over a million. Gideon overnight has become a millionaire. <laughs> uh, this one who was poor in Manasseh and less than the least of his father's house is now a millionaire. And what does he do with his, uh, with his uh, spoils of victory? Well, it says, verse 27, Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and then listen to this, all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare to Gideon and to his house. So he didn't invest that money very wisely. What he did, it became a snare to God's people. And so he enjoyed success as a leader. He refused kingship, which was a good thing. But his failure was on the priestly side of things. Dare we say that he rejected kingship, but he grasped at priesthood. And I'm going to explain that statement to you in a moment. But I want you just to at least think of this, because I think there are many men that do well uh, in terms of giving leadership, but they fail on the priestly side of things. And we've seen in our assemblies many good men, and they've brought in to the house of God, to the worship of God, things from the world, from outside, that have been utterly disastrous. And that's exactly what's going to happen here, grasping at the free priesthood. Why do I say that? Well, making an ephod, <coughs> an ephod was connected with divine worship. And he's making an imitation of something that was divine. And this imitation of that which was divine is made of Ishmaelite earrings. In other words, it's using worldly things and then bringing it into the divine and uh, making kind of an imitation of something that was given by God. Now, it won't take a lot of time, but I want you just to talk about the, the original ephod. And that uh, original ephod, you'll find the details of it. And we're, we'll, we'll maybe turn there once, but I'm not going to ask you to turn there just yet. But in Exodus 28, um, verses 4 through 8, you have a description of the garments of the high priest. Okay, Exodus 28, verses 4 through 8. The ephod was part of the high priest's attire and... and uh, we also find in not only Exodus uh, 28, but we also find uh, it repeated in Exodus 39. So what is this ephod? Because um, this has always puzzled me for a long time. What is an ephod? Because it, it's not something we use in everyday language. And so it's a, a sleeveless tunic worn over his other garments. Okay, so it's this, this tunic that he puts on on top of his other garments, the high priest, it was made of costly and colorful materials, kind of weaved together with gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And it was attached um, 
attached to the ephod was a breastplate in which the 12 precious stones representing Israel's 12 tribes were set in four rows. And there was a pocket or a pouch in the breastplate which contained the Urim and the Thummim. And if you remember, the Urim and Thummim was how God gave guidance to the children of Israel. And so it was, these were objects. So the ephod contained this breastplate and had the names of the children of Israel on it uh, in, in these jewels that also had these two pockets that had the Urim and Thummim. And the Urim and Thummim was used to discern the will of God for the nation. And so objects used to di discover Jehovah's will on any particular matter. And so let's just, just look at that for a minute. Um, look at Numbers 27, uh, just to see how the ephod um, was synonymous, really, with divine guidance from the priest using the Urim and the Thummim. So Numbers 27, verse 21, he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord as his word shall uh, as his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And so stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. And then a couple of examples in Scripture where the ephod was, was so synonymously connected with the idea of divine guidance. Look at 1 Samuel 23, 1 Samuel 23, and verse 9 through 12. 1 Samuel 23, verses 9 through 12. David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Kyla to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Kyla deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, again, using the ephod, the Urim and the thumbing, he will come down. David and then said, David, will the men of Kyla deliver me? They will deliver me up. So again, it's used there. Now look at 1 Samuel 30. We've, we've looked at this when we went through 1 Samuel, but it's good to review and refresh our memories. Uh, 1 Samuel 30, verse 7, David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue after thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So what we're saying is the making of this ephod, this, this copy of the divine by Gideon using his uh, Ishmaelite gold, um, basically was intruding into the priesthood. And in this sense, it was intruding into the priesthood in that God had said that he would direct his people using the Urim and the Thummim concerning, connected with the ephod. Now, the ephod itself was nothing. The value of the ephod was dependent on the person who wore it. An ephod without a priest is simply a form of godliness without the power thereof. <laughs> and so here's Gideon. He's building this ephod, uh, making this ephod, but it really, it, it, he's not a priest. And uh, it's, it's really of no, it shouldn't be of any, considered any value. So why did Gideon do this? And of course, who are we to second guess? But, but at least let's give a suggestion. One thing that God had done to Gideon is that he had appeared to him and given him direct guidance. Right? We've, we've witnessed his appearing to Gideon and him giving direction to Gideon, telling him to tear down his, his, his father's grove and, and his altar to Baal, telling him to reduce the army. So there's been this, this divine revelation that has been given to Gideon. 
and maybe in Gideon's minds, he's saying, not just the priest gets guidance, but I get it now. You see, I'm a source of direction for the people of God. And so he authorizes the making of an ephod. And what he's doing is, is assuming that he would become an ongoing alternative channel of divine guidance for the nation of Israel. And I believe that that is the essence of Gideon's actions in verse 27, that Gideon believed that he was now a channel of the Lord's direct guidance in addition to the priest and the ephod of the Lord that had already been provided. And so what it would tell us is that Gideon wanted more of what God had given in declaring his will. He wanted it more. And what we could say is that Israel went after it with a godless passion. Again, look at verse 27. Gideon made an ephod thereof, put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And so no longer Shiloh is the place where men have to go to get direction. They come to Gideon in Ophrah to his ephod. And notice what it says. It says again in verse 27, that Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither a whoring after it. They committed spiritual adultery in going to Ophrah to seek the guidance of God from Gideon's ephod rather than going to Shiloh where he had set up the priesthood. And so Ophrah, Gideon's hometown, became a rival worship center. And not only that, but a rival form of worship, a copy of the ephod, but made all of gold. But again, Ishmaelite gold. And we're, we're told in the word of God that we have to be very careful about the matter of spiritual adultery. James, very practical epistle of James, chapter 4, verse 4, simply says this, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And it's, it's so easy for us to bring in the worldly into the divine. And it's a very unholy mixture. And I see that in the church today. And I'm going to just say some things, and it might offend somebody. And if it does, I'm not. That's between you and God. But but I believe that in th there's an apostasy in the church, and I'm, even in assemblies, and it's found in things like this: the bringing in to the church uh, of things like theistic evolution. It's a denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. Did God not know? how things happened in the beginning, that he had to have the help of science falsely so-called, adding its so-called millions of years to make it all work. And, and again, I really believe that theistic evolution is compromised with a capital C. It's, it's basically, it's giving in to, to the so-called scientific elite rather than simply humbly believing what God has said in his word. And I believe it's serious error. Not just that. And again, it's in assemblies. Uh, not just that. The, the psychotherapy and psychology. Again, I don't want to offend anybody, but the men who are behind psychotherapy, men like Freud and Maslow and these individuals, absolutely hated the God of the Bible. Freud was a sexual pervert, and he wanted to be able to do his thing without guilt. <laughs> the very guilt that God designed us to have when we're doing things that are contrary to his will. And so he came up with this whole psychotherapy system. And Maslow, I don't know if you realize, but Maslow had a pet demon called Philemon on his shoulder who gave him instructions. And many have integrated this stuff that is from the pit into Christianity. And I just believe it's a terrible, terrible thing. And so 
it's very possible that we could be guilty of that. And oh, how we need, yeah, yeah, we realize there are problems, but God's word is sufficient. How did, how did people manage for 1,900 years before the bringing in of the red leather couch where people kind of sat down and, and got in touch with their inner feelings? How, how did David do? I mean, his family was a disaster. How did he cope? Well, I'll tell you how they coped. They turned to the Lord. <laughs> That's what they did. They sought the Lord to be their comfort and their strength and not uh, these psychotherapic uh, type things. And so, beloved, can we encourage one another in these days of apostasy to stand firm in the truth of God and to have confidence in the gospel of God and in the power of the word of God to change lives? And so <clears throat> we notice in verse 28, it says, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the day of Gideon. Now, if you are a Bible underliner, I, I would encourage you um, to do something here. <clears throat> and um, and that, would, that would be underline the very end of verse 28. And the end of verse 28 simply says this. And the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. Now, why would I ask you to underline that? Because it's the last time that in the book of Judges, where the children of Israel have rest after their judge has delivered them. We, we've seen it already. Uh, let's just look back how there's been a period of rest afterwards. Chapter 3 and verse 11 for instance, it says the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Ken Kenaz, died. Uh, we saw it in verse 30 of chapter 3. It says, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years, 80 years. And then we see it in chapter 5 in verse 31. Chapter 5 and verse 31. It says, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest 40 years. And so now, finally, after Gideon, the country was in quietness 40 years, and you'll never read that again in the book of Judges. And what does that teach us? You see, what did they do with the rest that God gave them? Did they put it to good use? Did it cause them out of gratitude to God for this rest, to, to serve him more fully, to love him more completely? No, what happened to them is as soon as that period of rest came to a close, they did exactly what they're going to do here. Notice it tells us, we're just jumping ahead here, but um, it says in verse 32, Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried. And then it says, verse 33, it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam. So what we see is that they abused the rest. God gave them this rest. And instead of basking in his grace and mercy and drawing closer to him, as soon as the judge died, they went back to their adulterous ways. And this time, God says, enough. They abused his rest so often that this proved a step too far so that he did not grant it to them again. And it's very dangerous to presume on the grace of God. It's, it's a dangerous thing for God's people to trifle with his grace and mercy and believe they can escape unscathed. I was just reading this morning in my devotions. I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 130. And I want to look at a few scriptures here about this idea of being presumptuous with the Lord. Psalm 130, just a beautiful psalm. Uh, and again, you can, par you can parallel, it, parallel it 
sorry, I'm getting too excited. My mouth's going faster than my brain here. Um, but you, you, you can parallel it with the book of Judges. Out of the depths, verse one, have I cried unto thee, O Lord. And we'll see that again and again in the book of Judges, right? When they're in bondage, out of the depths, they cry to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ear be attentive to the voice of my supplications. And then there's this great statement, if thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquity, O Lord, who shall stand? And we realize if the Lord was to mark iniquity, where would any of us be? Then he says, but there is forgiveness with thee. Oh, how thankful we are for the word forgiven. There's forgiveness with thee. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But notice what it says. There's forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. It's not forgiveness with thee so I can go on sinning again and then come back again and say, Lord, it's me again. And, you know, kind of this cycle that we see in the book of Judges can often be seen in our lives, a cycle of sin, confession, forgiveness, and then here we are again. And he says, no, there's forgiveness with thee that thou shouldest be feared. And then notice, please, another couple of scriptures in the Gospel of John. Just turn with me to John's Gospel. John's Gospel and chapter 5, John 5, and verse 14. John 5, verse 14. <clears throat> Afterwards, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Notice John, this gospel, chapter 8, in verse 11. The woman caught in adultery. What does the Lord say to her? John 8, verse 11. <clears throat> he, when, verse 10, when Jesus had lifted him, up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Jesus saith, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And so what we might say is that if we can learn a lesson here is this, let's not presume on the grace of God. Let's allow God's forgiveness. And it's wonderful that a thrice holy God would forgive us. And at what cost? was that forgiveness procured for us through the blood of his son shed on Calvary's cross. And, oh, it would be good for us not to presume on his grace, not to uh, take it lightly, but there's forgiveness with thee that thou shouldest be feared. Oh, Lord, teach me the fear, thy fear, the fear of the Lord. And so it says, in verse 29, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. So his, his fighting days are over. He's gone to his own house. And it says, tells a little bit about his, a window into his family life. And it says, Gideon had three score and ten sons of his own body begotten, for he had many wives. And we said he's, he's already acting like future kings, uh, taking to himself many many wives. And if that wasn't enough, as well as the many wives, it says in verse 31, he had, his, he had a concubine that was in Shechem. Yeah, Shechem is six miles southwest of Ophrah. And so he had a, a lady on the side as well as his wives. And uh, so this is, this is Gideon and uh, his uh, voracious appetite for women. And it tells us that this concubine that was in Shechem, she bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. And again, you, you know from scripture, Abba is the idea of father, and uh, Melech is usually connected with king, you see. So we said um, uh, that um, uh, <coughs> Elimelech, my God is king. Here, my father, Abba, is king. And so he called the son of his concubine, my father is king. Now, I thought that Gideon had refused the kingship, but he likes the idea, doesn't he? He's living like a king, 
and he calls his son, my father is king. And I suspect that there was this suggestion, satanic suggestion that had been put to him when he says each one resemble, like you resembles the children of a king really got to him. And beloved, can we just, let's not believe the press about what people think of us and what people say concerning us. Let's be honest in the presence of God. What are we? We're hell-deserving sinners. And if there's anything, anything remotely good in our lives, it is because of Jesus Christ and him only. And so be careful. Uh, think not more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly. And so it says in verse, uh, verse 31, he calls this son Abimelech. Just some con con concluding thoughts about Gideon. We'll, we'll look at their sin cycle in the remaining few minutes. But, but, but by way of practical application for you and I, oh, beloved, let's run well to the end. So many, so many in the word of God start well, but finish poorly. And again, Lord, I, can, I realize uh, to finish well, I need your help. I can't do this myself. We desperately need his help to cross that finish line well. Let's pursue. We saw that even if faint, even if others are indifferent, let's depend on the Lord's strength and presence with us and let's pursue. Faint yet pursuing. Remember that from last time. Let us keep clear on the priestly side of things. Net, let's not import into the house of God ideas that are coming from outside. If our meetings are not what they ought to be, instead of trying to look to worldly solutions to fix things, let's get on our faces before God and cry out to him to revive us again. Beware being corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ and bringing in things of the world into the priestly line of things into the house of God. Andrew, Andrew Bonar, he said, let us be watchful after the victory, just as much as before the battle. <laughs> Let's just be careful because there might be some landmines laying around that will be there to get us after the victory. So notice verse 32 to the end here. We just want to look at this sin cycle again. Gideon, the son of Joash, died in the good old age, was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their God. Now, interesting, Baal Bereth means Baal of the covenant. And so basically, instead of the covenant-keeping God who they'd entered into a covenant with back in Joshua 24, now they've entered into a covenant with Baal. This, uh, and of course, Baal worship was always under the surface in Israel's experience. And again, because of its connection with the sexual, because of, you know, he's a fertility, connected with fertility, and there was all kinds of horrendous sexual things connected with it. And so there was an appeal to it. It appeals to the flesh, Baal worship. And so that was always under the surface. And sadly, uh, this uh, six miles away from, from where we are in Ophir is Shechem, and that was where the nation of Israel had made a covenant. Look at Joshua just for a second, chapter 24, where they had reaffirmed their covenant with God. In Joshua 24, verse 24 and 25, where we read this, it says, And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And so very in the very vicinity where Joshua had made this covenant, 
with God and with the people, that they would be his people, they would hear his voice, they would obey his statutes. And in that place, now tragically, it says they went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth, Baal of the covenant, their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God. How easy it is to forget so quick. He had delivered them out of the hands of their enemies on every side, neither showed their kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. And next week, we will see just exactly what is meant here when it says they weren't very kind to the children of Gideon. <laughs> We're going to see that they actually had them executed. So it wasn't a very kind way to deal with them. But may God encourage us to press on and to be vigilant and to watch and pray, lest we also enter into temptation. Amen.